So at this point, may I now walk you through the webinar flow. The first two speakers and panelists will focus on the future of work and on the need for business and HR to thrive and prosper in the talent economy. The next three speakers or panelists will highlight the key levers to operate successfully in the talent economy, progressive people, practices, and technology. There will likewise be a used case at the end featuring one of the country's leading banks. Our format will be highly interactive among the speakers and panelists and fully engage the audience. Each speaker is given a maximum of five minutes for his or her inputs. And this will be followed by a lively interaction and spirited conversation. There will also be two Q&As involving the audience at strategic parts of the webinar to field critical questions from the floor. In line with MAP policy and in the interest of time, we will dispense with the lengthy introduction of our speakers. Their CVs will be flashed on the screen. I would like to remind our speakers and panelists that they are given five minutes each for their presentations. May I now call on our first speaker. Please welcome the CEO of One HRX Singapore and DLSU business faculty member, who is also the co-chair for strategic HR management of the MAP Human and Management Development Committee, Dr. Mon Sehismundo. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, and uh, thank you, uh, President Fred and uh, Chairman Rico. Thank you, colleagues. It's great to be uh, working with you today um, on how to survive and thrive in the talent economy. Firstly, I'd like to say that we do not have 210 participants. As of 9.14, we are now 235. Okay. 235 and our intention for the next two hours or less is to engage with each and every one of you. So you'll see a webinar like no other, highly interactive, highly engaging, um, with a lot of energy coming from the uh, panelists and speakers. My job for the next five minutes or less is to make the case to have talent first, people first, organizations, CEOs, and senior leaders. Okay, so that's really what my job is all about. And let me start by repeating uh, the quote that uh, President Fred shared with us. So Beth, if we could just uh, start rolling my slides. I've seen this in my past 40 years in my human resources and general management career. We are paying too much attention to finance, numbers, money, but unfortunately, sometimes we forget that it's actually the people who conceive strategy, who execute the strategy, and who delivers the number. So direct quote from Ram Charan, right? So I'm just, I'm just repeating what President Fred said. And you, you could even do a uh, an analysis, right, of uh, the amount of time that organizations and even uh, associations uh, devote to, you know, in terms of finance, tax, strategy, general management, HR, and you would see that probably those that relate to people would be at the bottom of the list. Yet, they create a lot of impact, and yet, they create a lot of value. So Beth, next slide, please. 
And let me elaborate further, right? Because of this, um, what I see as the relative lack of attention, uh, people and talent practices may have not kept up to speed. Particularly in developing and emerging markets, some HR organizations um, are relegated to administrative functions. And unless you're a progressive uh, conglomerate, MSME, or an organization uh, that has the vision to really um, play successfully, HR is relegated to an admin unit. So again, it says that whether your organization is in the private, public, or civil society space, or a large conglomerate, affiliate of a global multinational, medium to small, medium enterprise, or even an entrepreneurial startup, again, your sustainable success is either propelled or limited by your human resources and capabilities particularly your key talents. I must also hasten to add, right, that in the Philippines, perhaps the, uh, the public sector is a human resources challenge of gargantuan proportions. And of course, we're hopeful and we're looking at the future, right? And somehow we'd be able to address this as we are all leaders in our own right. So most business leaders recognize the competitive advantage of people and talent, and yet the practices have not kept up to speed. Whilst we have not kept up to speed, the external environment is rapidly changing, right? Particularly for the past two years. And at this day and age, the way of doing business is agile, digital, analytical, collaborative, and technology-driven. So here you have a case where the external environment uh, changes day by day. You have, uh, you have black swan events, but at the same time, your internal environment, particularly your people practices, may not have kept up speed. Now, if you take a look at the next slide, I think it captures it captures what the future of work could be. And in fact, it's already happening. So this is from Deloitte in its uh, seminal article on the open talent economy. So gone are the days when all you had were just direct regular employees. Now you could have Five types of talents, uh, at least based on this uh, groundbreaking article. So you have the traditional balance sheet, which are the full-time statutory employees. And of course, you bear all the costs. You could also have partnership talent, right? So, um, you know, this, this could be employees that are part of a partnership or joint venture that you're in, and you only cover... Uh, partially costs of those talents. Borrowed talent, right? So, uh, you know, these are employees who are part of your value chain or ecosystem, but who reside on someone else's balance sheet, such as contractors, for example. And even these days, companies are um, lending employees, companies are leasing employees, then you have the freelance talents. These are the independent workers. These are the consultants. These are the uh, independent um, project-oriented uh, um, contractors. And then finally, open source. You know, these are people that offer themselves for services to organizations, sometimes for free, sometimes for a, for a fee as a service, right? So now you even have CEOs as a service. You have CFOs as a service as part of an SAAS. And um, these are basically the types of talents that you have to weave in a network. And that's going to be what the future of work is, right? 
And even the location, right? It could be work from the office, work from anywhere. It could be work from Starbucks, could be hybrid, could be a combination. So the future of work and the future of the workplace is closely intermeshed. So given all this complexity, given all this complexity, I would prescribe six steps that perhaps you could modify to your respective context. And if we go to the next slide, uh, the, the six uh, recommendations are outlined. If we go to the next slide, and this was inspired by the book, Talent Wins, the new playbook for putting people first, which I would suggest that you get hold of a copy, right? So the past two years has taught us a lot. And it has taught us to place people first. And my recommended six-point plan is as follows. Number one, leverage HR, right? It should serve as your transformation champion. Uh, it should form part of what's called as the G3, yeah, which is the CEO, the CFO, the CHRO, right? So it should assume um, a significant role. Number two, get the board involved in driving talent strategy. Okay, get the board involved in driving talent strategy. So shift the mindset of the board. Third, optimize your organization design, right? Because the organization design creates and develops and builds the capabilities that are required for success. So play around with your organization until you get to optimize it. Make your HR a source of competitive advantage. So have an HR that is progressive, that is innovative, that partners with the business, that is technology oriented, that is a real change champion. Okay, so assess your HR, be demanding of your HR. Second to the last, look at the top 2% of your key talents that um, creates perhaps 60% or 70% of the business value and really make them the happiest in the organization. It could be called positive discrimination, but you really have to focus on the critical few talents that would create a difference. And then lastly, the CEO should drive the talent agenda. The CEO himself okay, should do the attraction, retention, and motivation of the talent. So on this basis, I rest my case, and I would strongly urge you to make the necessary critical steps to have talent first, people first, organizations, and CEOs. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sunny. Thank you, Mon. We shall now have our first 10-minute Q&A segment. And for this Q&A, may I invite Ms. Carol Dominguez, Mr. Sandeep Chowdhury, Ms. Gina Ayala, Mr. JP Orbeta to join Mon in our Q&A. Two years after the onset of the pandemic, and as we gratefully witness the easing of restrictions, as well as an apparent move to the next normal, as some people might call it. How has HR changed in your organizations? What are your thoughts on the changing environment and ecosystem of HR easing into the post-pandemic era? Any one of you may, may start? Just jump into this fray. Carol, I could see that you are eager to speak up go ahead carol you're on mute, unmute kindly unmute carol thank you no no audio carol no it doesn't say you're on mute but you're no audio <laughs> for a while carol some um, Doing that, let me let me okay. just jump in. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, go yeah. Ahead, Carol's okay now. Carol's okay now. Great. So uh hi, um, thank you. Um 
uh, thanks for the organizing this and thanks for the kind invite. So I just want to pre-qualify that the color of my shirt doesn't reflect uh, my political <laughs> affiliation. I uh, just wanted to uh, right. make that clear because I, I totally <laughs> forgot. Um, anyway, I think uh, just a quick answer on your question. Um, you know, HR really became the center of our organization during this pandemic because uh, you know, the key to this was safety of our employees and making sure, you know, everyone was well taken care of, but also taking care of the business. So it was really important for all these policies to be driven. Policies like, you know, how do we work from home? Um, you know, how, how do we make sure that we're communicating? How, what are the new policies? Because it was so sudden, we all had to go home. So we had to make new policies um, very, very quickly. And in fact, even you know, in, in the beginning, right, uh, sharing of transportation, um, check-ins, check-outs. So HR became really uh, uh, the, the center all throughout uh, how do we communicate, which, um, which tools to use, how do you, you know, provide uh, these support to your employees, um, train learning and development. I mean, everything we did became very HR-focused. So I worked with the, the leadership team and our HR team um, to drive this. So, you know, we were constantly, I'm sure like most of you, you guys were having meetings with the leadership team and your HR team regularly to communicate with the people because we were all now working from home. So I think that was really critical. And then moving forward, um, as the pandemic got worse, how do you handle COVID situations? And then with, you know, so many months and years into it, um, how to make people healthy, how to, um, provide mental health, uh, you know, support, um, eat healthily. And even, even when Omicron came, right, because it was really confusing um, in terms of the work schedules, um, who goes to work, who doesn't go to work, and also providing the vaccines, um, you know, making sure that everyone's vaccinated, getting the booster, getting vaccines. It was really all about HR. When I when I think about it now, and it's really important. And now moving forward, it's still all about HR because now we need to think of, you know, the new setup, hybrid. How do you implement that? Is it three days a week? Is it two days a week? Is it all work from home? I mean, how are you gonna execute those policies? And then again, the challenges now in terms of recruiting, in terms of retention, it is really all HR. So I think uh, my key message is, HR really became the center of our organization. And I, as CEO, of, as CEO and our leadership team, became very involved in all these aspects. So that's just a quick sharing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, JP, you were ready earlier to jump Yeah, no, in I was just trying to... Uh, yeah, I think um, as uh, Mon pointed out, and, uh, and um, you know, as we were going through this whole thing, and as Carol already mentioned, I think H, the, the chief HR officer during the pandemic became the chief medical officer, became the chief uh, employee enga you know, engagement, became the chief uh, work from home guru. Um, you know, our role really evolved no? um, because as Carol correctly pointed out, um, how do we make sure that we are able to um, continue to keep our workforce productive? Um, and at the end of the day, it was HR pulling it all together, you know, pulling the technology team together, pulling the leadership team together, pulling the medical team together, uh, dealing with, ex you know, finding vaccines, um, looking for people where they can where, where they can isolate. If you remember in the early days uh, for people who didn't have places to isolate, um, you know, so our role really in, it evolved. So I think going back to the, the theme of this thing is that um, at the end of the day, HR needs to do what it needs to do. Um, it no longer is governed by a job description. Remember, we ourselves put in the job description sa, sa dulo and other things that may be assigned from time to time. Um, sure. Tinko, um, Sunny, and everybody else, that became our job um, really during the okay. pandemic. And other things that may be assigned from time to time became the okay. number one uh, role for us. No? So as you said, going out of the pandemic and into back to normal, um, I think that will continue. That's number one. Number two, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little more in my own remarks. Um, I think um, this whole concept of work from everywhere or work from anywhere or work where effective, they're coming in different, um, you know, 
different configurations now. I think that is, that is here to stay. And the question remains is, again, how do we make sure that we keep that workforce engaged, um, that they still feel that they're part of the organization rather than you know, separate islands and, 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 and separate satellites? Um, and then how do you retain that whole productivity? So let me stop there to give the other some, but again, just some thoughts uh, on your question, Sunny. Thank you, JP. How about Gina? If I may chime is, in? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all the members of MAP and very privileged to be part of this uh, webinar. So I think in, uh, in uh, the start of the pandemic and continuing up to now, um, HR was uh, thrust in the forefront you know, and um, was one of those in the organization, at least for BPI, really uh, hand in hand with the CEO and our COO to help navigate the organization yeah. through the ambiguity. So as we know, in pandemic, it, it, it um, thrust us into a sea of uncertainty. And it was imperative for, uh, for us to make sure that our employees, uh, first and foremost, are kept uh, safe, uh, uh, healthy, and well. So health and wellness and safety uh, was at the forefront and a priority. Also, we had to be very agile in the way we had to adapt to changing situations on a daily basis. So that entailed coming up with uh, policies on work from home, hybrid um, arrangements, uh, even having to arrange for um, bus services. And um, also a, adjusting how we do work that will help us balance uh, safety as well as productivity on the organization. At the bottom line, I think, for, I mean, it was emphasized the need to really care for our people. And HR was really the, how should I say, the person who had to make sure that was felt throughout the organization. Uh, San, uh, thank you, Gina. Sandeep, behind you, I see two words, people strong. Would it be all right to say people stronger? Yes, I think that's really what our endeavor is, uh, to make organizations believe that people are the real assets that will make them stronger. Uh, but thank you, thank you so much for having me a part of this eminent panel. It's certainly not an easy job to go after the three stalwarts. And honestly, I don't have much to really add from what we've essentially heard from all three of them. But if I could very quickly, Sunny, make an attempt to summarize uh, from what we heard from Mon, what we've essentially heard since the time we started this morning. Uh, I do believe the pandemic has given a newer definition to work, worker, and workplace. And if I was to just fundamentally focus on the worker category, the talent, the people, the employees that are essentially what we are constantly calling as our assets, we saw three massive shifts just in the last 24 months, which we hadn't really seen over the last many, many years. One, we saw the entire talent got democratized. So all of a sudden, as organizations were in this pandemic, they were not just restricting the definition of their current and prospective talent to the ones that were checking in and checking out at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Now, all of a sudden, we were very quickly creating a new talent model that had equal and a very critical and important place for the full-time employees that are dedicated to only working for one enterprise, to a very large population of gig contractual consultants, skill-based people that we started to hire. Also, we realized that when we have to hire slightly more innovative in slightly more innovative ways, we don't have to be restricted to people who are just in the close vicinity of the city or the country or the market where I'm located. I could fundamentally, because of checking in from anywhere and being productive, I could be located miles away in different time zones and that really doesn't matter because the world all of a sudden broke the boundaries and came connected. It's kind of a little paradoxical while the countries seal their borders and we really couldn't move even within the European Union. We actually saw people in Luxembourg working for an Indian enterprise, people in India working for a Philippines enterprise, 
and from the comfort of their home. So actually the world opened up while the country shut down their borders. And the biggest complexity that came to the HR leadership was, now what kind of an environment, what kind of a culture, what kind of a technology landscape do we need to create to help manage these people? How do I end up compensating person who is fundamentally going to be dedicating only about a couple of hours a day? Uh, what, what's going to be the definition of some very basic hygiene elements around leave time and attendance for people like these? What's going to be the definition of performance? What kind of contracts am I likely to have and so on and so forth? And we also realized that there was not just the focus on the work getting done or the hours being dedicated into work, the entire shift for enterprises moved on to outcomes. Now, it really didn't care that whether it was a particular time in which the person was getting that work done, what was more critical for organizations was how is the work getting done? What are the outcomes that we are essentially able to push for ourselves? And all of this saw a massive emergence of technology, which traditionally was being called as HR. And I do believe progressively is falling into the definition of work tech. There was a massive intersection that came in of how do we really need to help employees complete their transactions to actually empower and make them far more productive, to make elements like collaboration, which always sat outside of the realm of HR tech, more contextual and integrate all that because I can't have an employee coming and interacting and feeling a part of one enterprise by logging into five different windows. So integration and seamlessness became a very, very critical part of what HR was delivering to adding to what my friend JP said. I think HR also ended up becoming the chief experience officer because now experience counted and mattered the most. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I'd like to build on what you said earlier on the convergence of work, work, worker and workplace because i think that's that's at the nexus of of how the the next normal is shaping up for example we have some uh, rumblings <laughs> maybe a strong word but uh, in some sectors of the philippine economy there's some discussion on how best to to move into the next phase no? and there's compressed work week so, uh, should it be hybrid or should, should people that used to do their work virtually be required to go back in order to comply with some uh, uh, investment requirement, investment law requirements? Uh, I'm, I'm sure our panelists would like to weigh in on, on the current issues that have emerged. You know, Sadi, if I can very quickly jump onto that one, I'm not necessarily very familiar with exactly what's going on with that in Philippines. Uh, but it's always been the order, even in the most developed and evolved parts of the economy in Europe and in North America. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing play out closer home in places like Southeast Asia and parts of emerging economies around the world. Uh, technology has evolved far, far quicker, and the changes in regulations have always followed there is always a bit of a lag time between what technology can help you enable and what the regulators actually end up doing to catch up to that. Uh, I, would, I would imagine that each one of us need to be a lot more patient because it will take time. For example, social media evolved and erupted uh, like a volcano and most of the countries really did not know what kind of regulations should be put into place to be able to manage that. GDPR was another one when the entire data around the world got democratized and then different markets and different countries and societies started to come together to protect their data. So I would imagine that much of the regulators eventually will come around. I guess all that my request to them would be uh, do it quicker because I guess uh, we still have this entire opportunity that we can wrap our arms around, but very soon we would not be. I'd like to, to ask Gina in particular. No? Oh, 
because of the the fact that even during the early phases of the pandemic even under the most restrictive phases banking was considered an essential business and there were, there were probably more people uh, working <laughs> as compared to working from home uh, what was the experience of bpi and uh, and other banks yes um, thank you sani so as as you said since banking is considered a an economic frontliner uh, our people were uh, called to our famous quote, stand by your post. And exactly that was done by our people and proud, I'm very proud of that. Uh, we have uh, our branch uh, frontliners uh, that never stopped going to the office and all the support areas doing back, uh, back end uh, work for our branches also never stopped going to the office. Um, and uh, we had again to take into consideration that, um, that, that fact that we have people who are exposed to the COVID-19 virus, and thus we had to heighten our uh, safety protocols, uh, institute um, a processes and procedures and assistance also, no? assistance in the form of services, allow uh, bus services, allowances, carpooling, so that we can uh, help um, decrease their exposure to COVID-19. And um, at the same time, um, we also looked at other segments of our organization that can uh, be able to do work from anywhere or work from home. And we had to adjust our uh, working arrangements from one that is fully non-mobile, meaning from what we used to have where everyone is coming to the office every day. We allowed people to uh, spend uh, several days in the, in, in, during the week to work from home. So it's a balance of uh, what the work needs to, what work needs to be done, who needs to do it. And at the same time, the health and wellness of our people. Okay, uh, thank you, Gina. How about in your field, Carol? Uh, what change? Uh, what What are the uh, the new developments in the in the uh, in in your field that that so, COVID has wrought? <laughs> so sorry. Can you hear me? Can you, can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes. You're you're oh, you're actually, coming in clearly. Funny. I I want to just also uh, weigh in and give my you know I, I response to Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, I don't know what's going on in India, but. Here in the Philippines, um, I think Sonny was referring to this, uh, you know, big issue with the BPOs because they've been required to return to work. I think it's been extended, but there's a big, um, you know, uh, discussion about, uh, you know, returning under the PESA and PESA requires all these companies who have invested right. in these tax-free zones to come back to work. So that's been, been a discussion. And I don't really know what you guys are doing in India and NASCOM. Um, but here's my take. I think that um, companies should really do what works for them. I'm mean, just like BPI, you know, they've uh, looked at, the, you know, the different kinds of work and they've decided which work needs to, you know, be working from home and which work needs to be, you know, done at the office and so forth. So I think uh, eventually companies have to decide that. I, and for me, like if the BPOs think that, um, this work from home situation has worked for them for two years and has generated a lot of savings and it's safer for their employees to uh, stay home, work at home, you know, because the work is at night, right? So it's, it's, and it's, you know, a lot of transportation costs are saving money for food, for coming into the office, a lot of infrastructure, 1.3 million people working in the BPO industry, a lot of electricity, um, technology, spend, and so forth. I mean, if they think that the work from home arrangement works for them, I don't see why they shouldn't do that. Now, having said that, for companies like ourselves, John Clements, which is an HR firm, I still believe that um, we, we should come to work at least three days a week to be able to uh, communicate, build relationships, collaborate, to be able to innovate, to be able to build our culture. And that, that's important for, for us. And I think companies, going back to Sonny's question, I think more and more companies like ourselves, they're, they're evaluating what is the right balance. Is it three days a week? Is it four days a week? Or it's you know totally mobile? Or do they have satellite? Some companies have built satellite offices, you know, the hubs and spokes system. So every company needs to really 
assess what their needs are. Um, and so I think, you know, all of these uh, laws have to be relevant to what uh, corporations and employees uh, need to be able to thrive in these kinds of environments. Okay, thank you, Carol. I think uh, I've gone somewhat ahead of our program and, uh, and, and conducted a more extended panel discussion. But I also hope that this has sparked the interest of our audience. I could see that the chat box is still full of good mornings and how are you? <laughs> I'd like to encourage our, the members of our audience to, to start thinking of your concerns and write in your questions no, so that we could process this in our ongoing conversation. And at this point, I'd like to call in our second speaker. Uh, and please welcome the Chief HR Officer of AC Energy and the Co-Vice Chair for Strategic HR Management, Mr. JP Orbeta. JP. Thank you very much, Sunny, and good morning to everyone. Um, good morning again to my fellow panelists. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I'll try to keep this brief um, in the five minutes that uh, we've been asked to, to speak. No? Um, and um, just taking off from, from the whole theme about talent economy, the future of HR, the future of work. Um, I think HR, as you know, has gone from you know, several um, it, it, iterations. Like it used to be called personnel, personnel admin. You know, we moved to HR. Um, really, um, I've been, an, I've always espoused that HR should really be treated as a business enabler. And for me, the best way to capture this is to speak the, the language of business. Um, and that's why even early on, even before um, in my previous, um, my previous life doing consulting, HR consulting, I actually renamed our practice human capital consulting. And the reason for that is that you, you know, the word capital really links you more towards the business. Um, if you look at capital, it is, um, it is how do you best deploy um, you know, your resources to build the business? And at the end of the day, there are various forms of capital, right? There's short-term capital, there's different asset classes, there are different ways of, of, of raising capital, whether it's debt or equity, uh, or whether you're going to the bond markets, or whether you're going to take in partners. Um, you know, there's, there's so many ways of, of raising capital. Um, and, and that, for me, is the same mindset that we should have for human resources, for people. And I think that is what Mon has captured in his um, slide about, you know, looking at the different sources of talent, the broad, the balance sheet talent, the part, you know, the, which is really about, um, the, you know, your, your bricks and mortar people that are actually full-time employees, your partnership. Um, uh, talent, which is those, you know, um, of your um, contractors, your business partners, your, you know, the, the, you know, the, the other operators that are part of your business that are not your direct employees, but for all intents and purposes might be called indirect employees. Um, your borrowed capital, as uh, Mon also mentioned, no? uh, these are the, the temporary workforce that you would bring in uh, for seasonality, etc., no? um, where you would actually be able to adjust and borrow capital um, or, or talent um, uh, as the need rises. And then there's this whole freelance world. Um, you know, in the US, they call it the gig economy, or as, as many other parts of the business call it, the, the gig economy, where people are available for very specific gigs, right? Um, and as we know, a gig has been used in the entertainment uh, sector for a set, right? Um, anong gig natin tonight, di ba? May, may, may isang set ka sa isang bar or whatever. That's the same concept now with freelance workers. It is so easy to go online and search for talent for a specific purpose, whether it's to design a website, whether it's to um, come up with a business plan, whether it's to just design your logos, you know, um, or even as somebody mentioned earlier, you can have CFOs for, for a temporary stint. No? Um, you have a lot of talent that are, pre, um, um, you know, that have retired, but are really still very much active and very much available. Um, so there, there's that whole world of freelance uh, talent out there. And lastly, the open source, as Mon said. Um, you know, um, um, Procter & Gamble, was um, R&D was very good at it. They had an R&D budget, they had an R&D organization. But what, what made them, um, you know, leapfrog was they opened their R&D to the world at large. And they basically said, whoever wants to develop any product for us, 
we'll welcome you. And if we, if we end up buying the product, we'll pay you the royalties, et cetera. But all of a sudden you have all of these scientists worldwide um, developing products um, you know, for, for, for companies. And, and, and that for me is what's called the open source. You, you actually just cast the net out there and, and, and really look for talent um, and make it um, um, at your disposal. Um, so that for me is, is really what, the, what we're talking about with the talent economy. It's looking at how can we look at people, how can we look at talent really as business builders, um, as really part of our value creation. And if you look at them as value creators, then later on you will, you will the other side of the equation, for, again, from the language of business, is value realization. Um, and, and, and again, I think it's for in, incumbent for all of us to speak the language of business as we look at talent. And therefore, it's not just financial economics that we should be looking at, but it is talent economics. And I think that is an entire area that needs to be looked at uh, and that needs to be addressed. No? Um, and I think that is the future for HR for me. This drives, so that's my first point. My second point is this whole need for the flexibility and diversity. And we spoke about it earlier um, already in the exchange. No? Um, and when I talk about diversity, it's not just about gender, race, religion, you know, the usual things about diversity that we're trying to capture. Um, but it's really that diversity of how we engage these five different types of talent, right? Our models, our laws, our labor laws are all about balance sheet talent. It's about full-time employment. It's about the 40-hour work week or the eight-hour work day. And therefore, anything in excess of that, you have to pay extra and all of that. That, that those kinds of laws need to be addressed, need to be looked at because they are not enabling this whole talent economy. Um, and that's why, you know, when you start hiring freelance and all of that, the last thing you'd want is six months later, they'll say, oh, it's not full-time employment. I said, they've been with you for six months now. Um, again, and that's because that's our labor laws, right? Um, and so we need, to, there's a whole, so uh, Asani, your point earlier, it's not just the, 40, the, the four hour work week, a uh, four day work week. It's really our entire labor code uh, that needs to be looked at if we're going to now respond to the needs of this new economy. Um, and therefore, how does one, again, from an HR standpoint, look at how we can enable our uh, business by, by exploring all of these different talent sources and talent um, contracts, no? talent um, uh, agreements. No? Um, we've heard of the great resignation, right? Um, people are leaving their jobs because they do not want to work full time, because they do not want to come to the office, because now there is a viable alternative of work, of working from home, working from anywhere, working from where effective, etc. cetera. Um, Sandeep may have mentioned this already earlier, people in Manila working in India, people in India working for the US, people in Europe work, you know, uh, it really doesn't matter where you're located, right? But again, our laws are restrictive. And, the, and as Carol said, the PESAS concept of, no, if you're going to be PESA compliant, you have to be in the office for that to count. Uh, otherwise, you lose your PESA accreditation. Again, this is all going against the grain of the reality of, of, the, of, of where we are today and the needs of the future. So again, um, I think there, the second point I'd like to make is really this whole need for flexibility, diversity, and, and creativity, really, and how to engage and how to, can we bring this talent really um, to work for us uh, and again, as part of my first point, and able to, to, to be able to deliver um, and build a business. My last point, really, in, this, in, in, this, in my comments, is if we accept these two premises, then the next question is, how do we plan for it? Um, right now, the HR practices um, is always about budgeting, right? How many, what's the headcount that we need next year? What's the cost of, the, of employment that we need to adjust, et cetera? We have very rarely done what, what, what has been referred to as strategic workforce planning, meaning how many people will we be needing to, 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 um, you know, to deliver on the growth aspirations that we've set our, ourselves, that our business has set for the next three to five years? Um, how many of the people that we have today are actually going to be retiring in the next three to five years? Then, therefore, how are we going to replace them? Where are we going to get them? What kind of development plans do we need to do to be able for them to um, um, be ready at the time, at the time that, they, that they're needed? Um, so for me, strategic workforce planning needs to look at not just the numbers, 
but also the skill gaps. Um, what are the skills that we needed? Gina and I were talking just uh, earlier this week about, um, about you know, talent um, that we need. Remember Gina about, at, at BPI? And one of the things I said is, you know, one of the, the discussions that we have is, um, it's always the question is, um, is the talent that we will need three to five years from now the same as the talent that we have today as the incumbent? You know, many times the answer is no. Um, we've had this discussion, for example, when I was involved in hiring the CEO of Globe. And, you know, we had a very good, uh, successful, uh, you know, running Globe. But then we said, for the Globe, for the future, we need somebody different. And we ended up with, with an entrepreneur like in Ernest Koo and look at where he's brought Globe. Um, but he was a very different um, kind of CEO or breed of CEO from the predecessors that we had. No? Um, and so talent, strategic workforce planning, like I said, is not just about numbers. It's that, you know, I'll need to increase my headcount by 5% every year for the next three to five years. Uh, no, it is what's the kind of talent? What is the kind of mold of people that we will be needing? And how do we get there? Do we, do we buy it? Do we build it? Do we borrow it? Do we, you know? Um, do we start looking at the different um, Bs, so to speak? No? Um, and, and I think um, that is really, for me, um, what we're talking about when we say talent economy and the future of HR. As you can see, it's, it's really moving out of our comfort zones. Um, so to summarize, speaking the language of business, um, looking at creative ways of engaging the workforce, and lastly, making sure that we plan for it. It does, just doesn't happen. Um, the annual budgeting process of headcount and, and, and personnel, you know, planning is no longer um, 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 going to cut it. We really need to have a strong point of view on what it looks like in the long term. And by the way, that long term, I, I assure you, will, will be adjusted every year. What you say we'll need three years from now, next year may be different. Because why? The, the world has moved. New technologies come up. New, new um, opportunities come up. Um, all of a sudden... You know, in, in, in HR, we're talking about HR technology. We're talking about AI. We're talking about the ability to create bots. Um, we're talking about the ability to, 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 to develop APIs. You know, that is not really part of HR. It was always somebody in IT. But, you know, you can't just rely on IT today. So we're building our own technology capabilities within HR. Um, and so, again, um, I'll, I'll stop there, Sunny. Like I said, uh, I think my five minutes is up. Uh, but I just wanted to leave you with those three thoughts. Thanks. Oh, thank you, JP. I think you've uh, given us uh, a lot of things to, to think about. <laughs> but as I was uh, listening to you uh, talk about laws being uh, outdated or outmoded, it just occurred to me. Uh, we used to call we used to call them OCWs, right? Overseas contract workers. Then, by some stroke of imagination, it was changed to overseas Filipino workers or OFWs. And they comprise a big part of uh, the Filipinos' human capital. Uh, what we don't realize is even if we rename them as OFWs, they remained as contract workers, right? And uh, the most robust manpower sectors or more the more robust manpower sectors of our economy like for example seafaring no, in the maritime uh, global maritime uh, industry are all based on contract contract employment and yet uh, there's been a large hue and cry about contractualization and endo of course uh, I think we could all heave a sigh of relief. We dodged that bullet for the last six years. It's not; it's still being raised as an election issue now, no? and it's likely to be to be raised again. No? But uh, I think the observation of JP is that the, the the loss could really be left behind, because, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. No? For example, uh, COVID has really accelerated the pace of digital transformation and there's no turning back anymore no what 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 progress has been made in terms of digital transformation cannot be set back so this this changes the hr landscape in very uh, important ways and instead of uh, talking about for example amending the labor code 
which has been a 47-year effort <laughs> and has not gone <laughs> anywhere, uh, shouldn't it be more of what JP has proposed? No? More flexibility, creativity, innovation, ad and adaptive, adaptive uh, strategy, especially in the field of uh, people management. So uh, I'd like to invite your comments uh, on that panel. I think we have yeah. ample yeah, time Sunny. at this point. Sunny, my yeah. main takeaway from JP's uh, presentation is that I think the biggest enemy of HR is itself, right? When what I mean by that is um, we have to think in terms of, as what JP said, we have to be general managers first and foremost. We have to be business managers primarily. It just so happened that we're specializing on human resources. But I think that should be our starting mindset. Second, I think we have to be futurists. I think we have to be curious. I think we have to be excited about the prospects of the future to the extent that we constantly monitor it and become responsive and agile to all those changes that we expect. And thirdly, we've got to have a personal burning platform that if we ignore the future, if we ignore the external environment, then we ignore it at our own peril and we would be relegated to being administrators. So thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Mon, for those comments. Uh, Sandeep, you've been smiling and I think you, <laughs> you, you as you smile, you, you imagine new things. What's on your mind, Sandeep? No, thank you. Uh, JP, I think it was very passionately delivered. You made some very, very pertinent points. I'm essentially just going to pick on, on, on three elements, uh, which was a big flash in my mind as I was hearing you. Some of that would be very related to what you said. Some of that might be slightly sitting on the periphery. Uh, I did mention about this, uh, that the focus now is not on the quantity, but it is really on the quality. It is more on the outcome. And fundamentally, every way that we measure productivity, performance, uh, et cetera, has to be more done on outcomes rather than on any other element. The second element, uh, I think, which is far more pertinent to this one and is a new dimension I would essentially want to add. Today, we are gonna be sourcing for skill. And the moment you're sourcing for skill, you will fundamentally believe that you have to democratize yourself. You have to go outside of your traditional talent catchment areas to bring in the kind of talent that you essentially need to be competitive in this new world. And skills, as we all know, at best have a shelf life of anywhere between three to five years. So this is something that will continue to evolve. Now this three to five years is as we know today, I'm very, very certain that it is only going to further and further shrink where the skills will continue to get redefined in lesser and lesser time, which fundamentally means that the requirement for new skills will outstrip our ability to train and create new capabilities within our enterprise and hence the reliance to bring in a very diverse set of talent from different parts of the world will be a necessity and not just a good practice or a choice that organizations would have to, have to look at. My third point would essentially be around in this entire new form of working, engaging and delivering, the biggest casualty is of the title of a manager. We really don't need managers over managers over managers, which is the current talent pyramid that we see in most organizations. Because in a, in a very distributed manner, talent will fundamentally be self-managed. And more importantly, we will have, and we do have the aid of technology to manage and measure that. So we really don't need so much of human involvement and interface like the way we have today. So I would actually imagine that the HR cost structures over a period of time are likely to get more and more rationalized 
rather than balloon simply because we will constantly keep throwing people at the problem as opposed to finding more innovative and technology and distributed talent hybrid models to manage that element. And to the last point that you men mentioned, JP, uh, clearly the new power couple in the corporate world is that of the CHRO and the CIO. Uh, it is really, I think, the vision that they do have to create for the enterprise and even for the regulators to look at the possibilities that we are creating and not continue to stay with our constraint in uh, constraint thinking because we are constantly looking uh, into the rear view mirror to take decisions for the future, which I think is uh, a colossal mistake. Hey, thank you, Sandeep. Any thoughts, Gina? <laughs> I think um, we have been thrust into uh, um, looking into alternative ways of how we do work, no? uh, dovetailing with what JB said about being uh, the need to be more flexible. So moving away from what was traditional, fully on-site, to adjusting uh, work arrangements to what, uh, what fits for the role and uh, the needs of the business as well. No? And at the same time, um, this uh, flexibility will allow us to better engage our people. No? So for, for uh, um, putting a, the, 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 um, the priority for health and wellness uh, at the same time, now by having by allowing uh, hybrid work arrangements for certain types of uh, uh, employees, so I think that is uh, needed in this uh, uh, time, uh, given that uh, we, we we there are many constraints by which we cannot uh, um, given to us by COVID. Hey, thank you, Gina, and thank you to our panelists. And at this point, I'd like to call on our third resource speaker. Please welcome the president and CEO of John Clements Consultants, Ms. Carol Dominguez. Thanks, Sonny. Just checking again whether you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Again, I just want to you know, repeat that the color of my shirt does not reflect uh, my <laughs> political affiliation, just in case there are late covers. So um, thanks again for this kind in my wonderful discussion. Um, JP, uh, such a great uh, powerful discussion. I just wanted to add that uh, given the different kinds of talent we need to hire, five types of talent, hiring CEOs for the future that have are thinking differently, skills that, that don't, are not probably even there. I think we should also uh, be expansive or innovative in finding these talents and changing the ways that we traditionally look for them as well as um, the kinds of skills. It doesn't mean that you know, if they don't have this specific skill, they can't do the job. So I think overall, we need to uh, be more open in, um, you know, attracting these types of talents as well as retaining them because this is a different breed. Anyway, um, I've been asked to uh, briefly talk about, uh, you know, how companies are rethinking their, you know, HR practices and how are they, you know, um, how they could be more responsive to the needs of the new talent economy. Um, I've been listening intently to uh, the different speakers and I, I don't want to repeat what has already been said. So I thought I would just briefly uh, summarize my thoughts on the new talent economy and I, what I think, um, you know, what the needs are. You know, personally, I, I have six observations around the new talent economy. Um, you know, the first I think is talent um, needs to have a digital mindset. I think we talked a lot, it, you know, over the last hour, and I think the definitely COVID has fast tracked this digital transformation. So I think it's really, really important to, you know, not just find talent with a digital mindset, but we have to build them. So if we don't already have them in our organizations, we need to build them. And um, again, leading to the organization, you, you all alluded to uh, digital transformation. So my second point would be organizations, you know, if not already, they have to be undergoing a digital transformation. And the, so therefore, um, you know, talents need to have an agile mindset. You know, when we talk about digital minds, uh, digital transformation, you know, sometimes we just talk about, oh, let's 
you know, have all these systems and they should work together and connect. But digital, you know, transformation is more than that. It's ha- making sure that the companies have uh, organization, you know, the organization has no silos, that all the systems uh, work together. I, I don't know if you, you know, you came across uh, uh, one of the CEOs, I think, um, Reed Hastings uh, of Netflix, was it him? He said that if anyone doesn't, um, you know, if if, the, if anyone doesn't um, um, abide to, um, you know, putting down these silos, he was going to fire them. I mean, and also sharing data, especially when you want to transform your organization, make it digital savvy, a digital first organization. It's important to share data and bring down those silos. So I think that's key in, in building, a, you know, digital organization. And I think that's been a challenge. Uh, the third thing is, we talked a lot about it already, that talent can work from anywhere. You know, freelance work, you know, they have now this thing called cor- corporate nomads. Uh, you have part-time, I mean, you have the usual. And I think going back to JP's point and Sonny's point, our labor laws have to um, be, uh, you know, relevant to the new talent economy. Um, and I think the, the next two things, I think we haven't touched uh, a lot but I think the fourth thing is the most engaged talent with, would be those with a deep purpose and pursue their passion. So studies have shown that, uh, you know, people who, have, who, have, who are more passionate about their jobs are more successful. Companies who have a deep purpose are, are more successful. It has shown that they have greater profitability. So I think more and more, especially the young uh, millennials and the Gen Zs, they're looking for purpose and passion in their job. So I think it's important for organizations to try to align that. Um, and the fifth one is around um, ESG and sustainability. I think organizations are now looking for ways to do good while making profit and you know, at times putting long-term good over short-term profit. So I think, um, again, these young millennials, these Gen Zs, they're, they're always looking for companies who have a, you know, a big purpose, sustainability, saving the planet. So I think it's very, very important um, for organizations to be mindful of that. And, and lastly, I think it was already mentioned, is diversity. And it's not just about you know, women, LGBTQ, you know, having a mature workforce and so forth, but it's really in diversity of thought. I think that when, when there are diverse thoughts in, in the room, just like what we're doing now, you know, you have, you can spur innovations. So um, given those six um, ideas that I have, um, there's a lot that we need to do to rethink our HR practices, right? So the first, of course, is to train and coach employees to understand the potential of the data and release innovations within the workforce. We need to democratize, you know, innovation we make it available for everyone make sure that everyone does it we you give everyone skills um you know in, in data science or in you know coding for example i think some organizations are doing that i think that's imperative um i think one of the other trends is individualized training um paths i think historically you know we, we had this one size fits all so i think more and more as we segment the kinds of skills and workforce that we have it's important to come up with individualized learning paths with bite-sized learnings you know sort of like netflix channels um which is what the younger millennials and gen z um employees are looking at for and then we talked a little bit about, about work work arrangements hybrid remote work, um, you know, having satellite offices, um, spokes and hub systems, um, and also, you know, bring in culture, culture, um, you know, integration. So you have more and more, uh, you know, for example, the expats here, we have to acclimate them with the local environment. And of course, Filipinos working abroad or Filipinos who are here working for companies in India or the US, for example, need to how this culture acclimatization, maybe even learn the language. Um, and then the rest would be more on flexible benefits because you have you know, more choices, mental health support, and as well as being open to looking at talent anywhere and everywhere. Um, you know, having said all these, I think the biggest challenge that I think we all know that's phasing all of us is 
recruitment and retaining talent. I think, you know, we, we all talked about the great resignation. So that is still the biggest challenge we are facing. Um, raise your hand if you can tell me that you're not having a hard time finding and retaining talent. So I think that there's, there needs to be a greater emphasis on the kind of recruiting um, that we're doing. Maybe Sandeep could enlighten us on more HR tools using artificial intelligence and data science to really find the, the right talent more quickly. And of course, um, also a very uh, equally important is leadership development and training coaching for succession planning among other things um so just just sharing some of my thoughts thank you thank you carol there's a question submitted by christina lee from the audience christina is from our audience and she says here hi i'm working in recruitment department our current problem now is having high attrition rate because employees don't want to go back into the office and we also we are also having problems getting replacement replacements of those people who resign because they are not ready to work on site or afraid to work on site covid19 is still there because they have kids and parents who are already uh, seniors who might catch the virus from them my question is for miss carol how would you address these problems and how do you help clients to fill the vacant positions in their organization in, in the soonest possible time? Carol? Well, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be honest to tell you that it's very challenging. I mean, even, you know, we are a recruitment firm and we're having a challenge attracting talent, hiring talent and retaining talent so you know it's it's rampant but having said that i think um a couple of uh, things to look up, look at in your company how important is it to really come back to work i keep going back to the work return to work situation uh you know again because if it's not in, an important thing uh they don't have to come to work i mean that that's the one thing you need to answer how important is that um, and as I said, for me, I think three days a week is important. The two days, you know, people can work from home. So I think that that's really, really an issue. And then, of course, retention is about, you know, understanding these, these people. Like, why are they, what, what, what keeps them from staying? I mean, I mean, again, it's a real, real challenge. So you have to be on top of this. You have to keep on innovating, um, hiring, partnering with schools, uh, you know, we offer many, you know, things to our clients in terms of recruiting, uh, RPO, we, you know, do leasing, we, we have advanced technology now using artificial intelligence to, um, you know, recruit people. We are very active in social media. So basically, we don't want to leave any stone unturned to hire people. So fortunately, we're, you know, even if it's challenging, we are able to hire for our clients and ourselves. We have a program called Recruitathon. We have this program where we encourage shifters to enroll in this one week program and we'll teach them to recruit and we hire them and we send them as well to our clients. So I think my message is you really have to analyze first what are, what are your issues, what is your goal, and what are you going to do to you know implement what you want to you know what you want to do in the future so um you know if you want to have a longer chat about this please uh, send me a message i'm happy to meet with you thank you thank you carol that's from christina lee and uh, there's feedback from rafael de Asis. very well said miss carol great insights and earlier too uh, there were comments directed to you carol totally agree with you miss carol the government should also hear the side of its people and companies' perspectives. Thank you for that kind input. And that was from Queenie Rose Almasan. And from uh, Angeles Almodal, I totally agree with you, Ms. Carol. The company should decide uh, what, what works, should decide what works for them. And I think there's a general comment from Nika Santos. It's important to still collaborate 
personally to really build or continue the company's culture and of course values so thanks carol for your insights and i'd like now to call on our fourth speaker please welcome the ceo of people strong mr sandeep chowdhury thank you sony am i am i audible is it all clear? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chad. Sandeep. Perfect. I'm just going to request my colleague, Ray, if he can actually pull up the slides. Uh, but really, thank you again for having me a part of this rich panel. The discussion so far has been very, very rich. I think it's very relevant and it's very amazing to learn from everyone's perspective. Uh, what I'm here to share with you uh, over the next five minutes or less is a very quick summary of how technology is really helping organizations win in, the, win in the talent economy, certainly the current era we are, that we are all living in. We've heard how the talent economy has emerged as a combined impact of how the workforce has evolved post the pandemic and the need to create growth. What it means is that organizations will continue to compete globally for high potential talent. The talent of people will continue to be the newest currency, will have the negotiating power. So the big question staring at us is, how can organizations leverage technology to attract, engage, and retain people? Uh, what I'm really going to bring to you is our experience of having worked with over 500 large enterprises across the emerging uh, markets of, of Asia Pacific, all the way into Middle East, Africa, uh, and how and what we've essentially seen as the differentiating factors of how organizations are very successfully delivering a personalized, highly empowering, and a very experiential way of managing and engaging with talent. You know, very clearly, HR uh, tech has seen multiple phases of evolution. Uh, from just being a digitization tool, and this is really when we coined the term called the human resource information systems because we were just trying to put all the data, disparate data on people on HR in one central place uh, to how we are essentially trying to impact the business results through technology. And that's really, I guess, at the very basic level, the definition emerging for HR Tech 4.0, where people experience is really going to be defining the business outcomes where innovation is going to be driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning and how we end up in the ingesting data and providing insightful decisions for the leadership and where talent is the core of technology helping organizations bring the agility in their people operations and create their business impact. If you look at it, there are three core areas where HR Tech 4.0 is enabling organizations to overcome these three challenges. One, we are fundamentally talking of data-driven decision-making on talent and not taking subjective calls. Uh, for example, trying to fill in a nine block talent model by bringing in people around the room and then looking at what their understanding and assessment and talent is. We believe all of this should actually be done through technology and only exceptional cases should actually be up for a debate or a discussion. The second element is really about delivering a hyper-personalized experience for your people, bringing agility to people and business operations. Many of the previous speakers have spoken about culture and how the organization of culture will essentially get redefined in this new era of hybrid work, how if we don't have access to people physically between nine to six, will they be able to integrate into the organizational culture? And I, I fundamentally believe that that culture and that infrastructure that we've essentially been creating is far fast getting replaced and getting delivered through technology. One of the examples of a very large comprehensive financial services provider in Southeast Asia that we essentially work with has been able to use technology to drive productivity in their teams and to drive productivity as a key measurable 
item for the HR function. They fundamentally looked at identifying the right talent and hiring them faster. Uh, much of this was essentially delivered through an AI powered matchmaking. They were driving real time visibility of the kind of skills they need for success at different roles. Uh, the skills they currently have, they identified the gaps to improve productivity. They developed individual development profiles for the high potentials, not just for the high potential, but for a large part of the organizations and plugged in personalized training and learning program. Integration of the talent profile with the learning management system, which fundamentally is missing with most organizations. In fact, when I hear CEOs say, that people is my topmost priority, but yet they would call out that I am significantly failing to deliver on that topmost priority. It is not a question of intent. I fundamentally believe it is a question of the tools which are available to the CEOs and to the leadership to be able to execute on their very, very people-centric vision. This also ultimately enabled organizations closer home in Philippines like Inspiro. We are very proud to be their HR technology partners where we were in charge of bringing agility to their business operations. Visibility for their employees, productivity is really what fundamentally helped them allow not just managing the workflow, but actually delivering to exactly what the business was asking for, which is, for them to be able to deliver a high performance workforce to business. Inspiro as a BPO company, you would know naturally faces high employee attrition with multiple seasonal periods over a course of a year. Inspiro uses the People Strong's recruitment solution to identify and recruit the right talent using resume parsing and AI powered matchmaking the candidates uh, bringing in the right candidates for, for the job roles. They've been able to increase the speed of hiring. They've been able to improve the quality of hiring. And more importantly, they've used the AI-powered chatbot very, very effectively to respond 91% of the employee queries without any human intervention. Data has been fundamental, I guess, to organizations like Inspiro for them to take more decisions, which are one, across the entire of the enterprise. In the absence of this, much of the HR and the CEO's effort is only focused on the 10 and at best to the 15% of the high potentials. But we clearly understand today that our focus needs to be to create at least 85% of the organization to be high performance. Why is that we are only expecting 15% to deliver to 120% of their potential and actually are quite okay with the rest of the organization delivering to a very mediocre outcome. And that's fundamentally because we've not been able to create a very personalized learning and a capability opportunity for each of those individuals to be hyper active and hyper productive in our enterprises. I'll give you a, as a closing remark, a very quick analogy of what a talent operating system should fundamentally do for an employee and for a manager or a business leader. If I'm an employee in an organization at a click of a button, I should fundamentally be able to understand what are the various career choices I have available to myself. I should be able to click on one of them and understand what's the gap between my current and my desired competence to be eligible for that opportunity that I aspire for. I should know who are the people in my current environment, in my organization, my colleagues who've been able to make that transition in the past and have they raised their hand to mentor me in this journey. Now, all of this is possible if all of my data, right from the time I got hired in the company to all of the performance appraisals that I take place in, all the 360 degree feedback, the training programs that I've essentially attended are coming together to give me a very directional input on how is that I can leverage the opportunities in this organization to the best of my ability 
and interest. Now move to exactly what a manager or a business really wants out of it. At a click of a button, if you are able to know how many people are ready now or ready in the next 12 months and interested in this new career opportunity or a new role that you really want to start in your company, won't that really help you save a lot of time and actually find a ready and an interested candidate from within your existing talent pool? This is at the very, very basic level uh, what I feel talent operating system needs to deliver to an employee and back to its businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna leave you with a small gift. It is a fully customized report for your talent management. It provides you the benchmarks from some leading enterprises across Asia Pacific. So scan in the QR code and take a 10 minute assessment and you will have that report very quickly emailed across to you. But thank you and back to you, Sony, and very happy to take any questions or, or, or even learn from the perspective of other panelists. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I'm still hoping to see questions in the chat box from our participants. Uh, while they're composing their thoughts, I'd like to request our panelists to, to jump in and engage Sandeep on any or some of the points that he has raised. Sandeep, if I may comment. Uh, Go ahead, Gina. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sandy, for, for that very um, in, insightful uh, sharing. And um, I think this whole thing about HR technology, um, for us, the heart of it all is, as we speak about um, making sure we provide our customers superior experience, the employee experience cannot be less than that. Okay. So we have to go in parallel in terms of our efforts in um, putting focus on superior customer experience, uh, as well as giving our em employees superior employee experience. And technology has a lot to do with that. No? Uh, in the, uh, as we are in the midst of digitalization, uh, it's important that we're able to, to uh, digitalize our HR platforms and processes to make the experience of our employees delightful. You know, beautifully said, uh, Gina, clearly every customer-centric organization first has to be employee-centric. Uh, only then can we expect them to deliver. I think Ritz Carlton is a brilliant example worldwide where they do believe in taking care of their people. We will deliver the promise to them first and then make them capable of delivering it to their customers. So can I ask okay. a question? Sure, Carol, go ahead. So Sandeep, you sort of mentioned something around um, like, uh, you know, do people need to work? Do we need to see each other? And you talked about how technology will play a role. I, can, you, can you elaborate on that? Like, uh, I mean, is it still important to, you know, see each other and build relationships or how can technology or what is technology's role in in uh, in this whole you know, right. gamut of, uh, yeah, thanks. No, very clearly, I think um, the balance really for us is to build a, a high touch with a high tech. Um, in fact, only yesterday I was talking to my son and I said how humans have fundamentally not got the balance right in almost everything. Uh, and I do hope that with that realization, one, I guess technology is, for example, I'm just gonna give you an example of collaboration. Now collaboration to me is not just uh, chit chatting, but it is fundamentally to make it very contextual to what will help me achieve more in today's day. Uh, for that, I need a collaboration platform where I'm not just able to have an exchange of dialogue, but actually receive feedback, allocate tasks, not have an obsession to constantly huddle people onto a Zoom call or into a conference room. Uh, from wherever I am, be able to 
make them significantly more productive and feel empowered to move forward. Much of the work tech innovation, which has happened over the last three to four years and actually accelerated in the last two years is all about saying, how can I create a real-time experience as close to a real-time experience where collaboration becomes the newest currency for innovation and delivering of the organizational culture. The second element I really do believe is even when we are back in a hybrid model, and I totally agree with you that we don't need to have one dogma against another. So from being obsessive about having people in one location, we don't need to move to a complete obsession that we don't need people, we don't need offices and so on and so forth. I do believe the hybrid is fundamentally where the balance would need to come up. My biggest worry has been right from the day one of the start of the pandemic, we have been talking about the life post pandemic, which somewhere alluded to the fact that we are eager to go back to our old ways of working. And in my opinion, that world will take away the benefit and the advantages that we've actually seen in the most gloomy period in our lifetimes over the last two years. Uh, there is significant amount of balance that we can actually create between our business operations. For example, work-life balance is not something that any enterprise can promise, but work-life balance is what every enterprise can help give the choice where employees should be able to manage and create a better work-life balance for themselves because that balance could be having a very different definition for me and a very different definition for you. And that's where I guess technology is significantly playing a very critical role in streamlining and putting data in front of us as opposed to our older ways and our comfortable ways of working. Uh, in fact, some of the most productive organizations, uh, even way back, look at the largest encyclopedia on the planet today, which is Wikipedia, is created by people who just volunteer. They don't even get paid. It is run on donations. And we all know how many times do we actually refer to Wikipedia and a very similar project in Microsoft which consumed millions and millions of dollars was an absolute failure because we were trying to fit an organized way of working to create something that had never been created. So I do believe that innovation will happen when resources are restricted, when we're not bringing in the older tools and methods and ways of working and we leaving a lot to be imagined and delivered. Thank you, Sandeep. I think your comments would be well appreciated by uh, our, our friend and colleague, Jerry Plana, former president of People Management Association. He just commented on the, on the Q&A box that the hybrid work arrangement, it seems, will continue to be used as we further experiment on it. One example of an arrangement is, say, three days in the office and two days work from home in a week. With continuing acceleration of technological advances, well, he wanted to know, and I think we have answered this. What is your perspective of where work will be performed more? And he's also raising the point of whether management is prepared to, to go to a diff, totally different direction. And especially important is that people become happier, more engaged, and productive. So we'd like to, uh, and uh, he was also asking Mon says Mundo to answer these questions live, but I'd like to request Mon to, to hold on, off on his replies for now, because uh, I think it would be better if we are able to hear all our panelists' views. So may I now call on our fifth speaker, the Chief HR Officer of the Bank of Philippine Islands, Ms. Gina Ayala. Gina? Thank you. Thank you again, Sunny. Good morning, everyone. If I might be allowed to share my screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you once again, and really happy to be able to share with you the evolving story of BPI. As you know, BPI is the first uh, bank in Philippines and the first bank in Southeast Asia. 
we have 170 years stuck in our history. Uh, we are an 18,000 strong uh, organization. We'd like to believe that at BPI, we continuously transform and reinvent ourselves. That's why we are still very much around. Internally, we aim to be nothing but the best and to be at the top of our game. Our mission is to provide, it is to, to build a better Philippines, one community, one family at a time. So this mission and vision comes to life with a confluence of several factors, culture, strategy, people, process, and technology. So at BPI, our um, story of transformation goes like this. Now, as we come from a, a long um, tenured history in the Philippine industry, we are known to be the pioneer in Philippine banking with a strong reputation for its excellence in traditional banking. We would like to evolve into an agile and highly engaged workforce with a customer obsession mindset and digital to the core. So let me highlight these things, an agile and highly engaged workforce, customer obsessed and digital to the core. So our priorities to be able to achieve uh, that are, are, are as follows. Let me start first with culture. Um, our experience has been amidst the pandemic, we saw a leap in our employee engagement. Now the highest ever score, uh, highest score ever attained by BPI uh, from prior years, besting Philippine uh, and Philippine norms and global high performing companies. And we believe this level of high engagement was what allowed our people to show up every single day at our branches, at our offices, at our back office, uh, at our back, back rooms. They stood by their post and showed up every single day to heed the call of duty, something that really makes us very proud as Unibankers. We've also embarked on a um, uh, re-transformation or reinvention of our values. Uh, we have the NICE or the NICE values where we espouse being nurturing, uh, integrity, customer obsession, and excellence. No? And we are um, providing uh, avenues and venues to be able to inculcate this in the hearts, minds, and um, actions of our employees. The main shift that we are doing is to, towards a uh, customer obsession. No? And here we've also um, started our journey towards being more customer centric, as we believe that the customer should be the center of all our decisions. So it's a whole transformation uh, um, program that we are embarking on in BPI. Along with that is uh, as we look at the needs of our customers, we realize that we have to transform transform roles, particularly our um, brand, branch uh, frontliner roles. So we are talking about transforming our branch personas uh, from your traditional banking um, uh, positions of uh, tellers. Uh, we are transforming them to be more of uh, uh, um, sales and financial advisory personnel. And that involves micro-skilling, upskilling, and um, in fact, also bringing new talent you know, for this uh, particular um, objective. And making the organization digital to the core. You know? So we'd like, uh, we are like to grow our digital employees as we, uh, we call it. So growing digital and tech natives. So we've shifted from what used to be the traditional recruitment on bank, banking um, talents on, uh, I mean, so we, we are starting to hire data ar architects, uh, UI, UX designers, um, IT architects, platform management. So the new and emerging uh, positions or roles needed by uh, a digital uh, organization. Um, internally, we'd like to build our uh, internal digital quotient no? and data capability by coming up with what we call the Future Tech Academy. So, putting in a courses, uh, making courses on design thinking, agile methodology, data analytics, which has become very important and uh, critical in our organization. So we'd like to spread that discipline across the organization and not just centralized to a particular group. Last but not least about future proofing the organization. So as um, talent, as we said, people is very important. That's why we put a lot of effort to strengthen our leadership bench, making sure we have a pool 
of uh, talents who are ready to fill in the positions. Uh, by, and we do this by having a robust uh, talent review and succession planning process. Also, we've come up with a segmented uh, leadership development program that uh, allows us to provide uh, specific uh, programs to develop the leadership skills of our uh, talents, depending on the leadership ramp where they are in. So as we go into this uh, transformation, we also, also look into how we need to reinvent how we work. Okay? So balancing, as I said earlier, the safety, health, and wellness of our people at the same time, the business requirements. That's why we have uh, gone into segmenting our employees on who are considered to be non-mobile, hybrid, and also uh, mobile employees, depending on their roles and depending on the capability to be able to work anywhere uh, or work at whatever convenient place that they deem it uh, fit. That also includes um, the need to look into how we design our work offices. Now, as we now go uh, into more hybrid working arrangements, uh, we are redesigning our workplaces to accommodate um, what when before it was a one one is to one. No? So one person is entitled to one workstation with a hybrid workplace and even with mobile employees, we are able to design workspaces that will now allow sharing or hoteling, hoteling uh, workstations where you don't have a permanent space. You come in, you, 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 you come in, you take a desk and once you're done uh, for the day, you wrap up your things and put it in a locker. So that is how we would like to um, reinvent as well our workplace. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. That was a very enlightening uh, sharing of your thoughts about the BPI story. Um, it's now 10.48 and we're into the home stretch of our forum. And uh, there's this prompt from our MAP MAP Secretariat that before we go further and wrap this up, we would be having a short photo opportunity with our speakers. So may I request Carol, Sandeep, Gina, Mon, JP, and President Fred Pasqual to please open your videos. I think uh, Rico should also join us here. <laughs> So just tell us if uh, our photo op has been done. Maricel, President Fred is not on the screen. Mr. Fred, please turn on your video, Sir Fred, Sir Fred. Okay, while waiting Sir for Fred. Fred. One, two. Three, another one, please. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Arnold. Thank you. So we'll now move into the home, home stretch phase of our interaction. Uh, and I'd like to, to invite the panel to, to give their response or reaction to what Gina just shared. And while you're collecting your thoughts, just to read some, some of the, the comments and questions in the Q&A box from Harshita Gupta. I'm a very strong believer of working in teams and that they work. Work from home resulted to less personal interface. However, I have not observed much remote team building. Are there HR efforts to have their organizations focus on this? Remote team building. Anyone from the panel would like to respond to that? Yeah, I can. I can go ahead. No? Um, and Gina and I, um, you know, we, we do this um, a lot, at, uh, not just in in our companies, but also across the Ayala Group. No? Um, so we go have ahead. a lot of um, we have a lot of things like Inomans, um, you know, where we actually have our little teams get together. Um, we've actually sent celebrated birthdays by sending food to everybody and, and actually all sharing a meal on Zoom. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's many creative ways of doing this. Um, we, we're having our second E-Games uh, Olympics uh, that we're going to have. Um, and um, how many did we have last year? Gina, 400 teams. But I mean, we had 
you know, from all across to the group, you know, and um, so they were playing Mobile Legends. Um, and of course, you know, um, it, obviously that's a different generation, Asani, right? But um, we were just amazed at how many people were engaged, no? Um, you know, it doesn't take much for our employee engagement teams to set these things up. And like I said, when a platform is available, um, like like Zoom or Teams or, you know, Google Meet, or, I mean, there's, there's, there's always an easy way to do it. And like I said, um, little things just, you know, sending... Um, like I said, celebrating a birthday by by having food delivered and all of you come to... And by the way, it, sometimes it's not just food. May, may kasama pang soju. Um, para, you know, na, para meron ng konti, you know, so there's soju in, there's there's pika-pika, there's... Ano, but um, it, you, you're able to still have that sense of belonging, I think, if you are able to organize these things, even if it's virtual. Um, we continued... Last night, we had in our... In ASEN, uh, an acoustic night. So we had 80 people on site, um, you know, sing along and karaoke, but we had another 80 people online live streaming. Um, and while we, you know, while those are the people who we couldn't pass the mic to for karaoke, um, you know, they were highly engaged. There were comments, they were, uh, you know, giving their, um, uh, their uh, reactions, you know, so there's, there's a lot of ways that you can actually do this. Um, and, and not just physical. I think people are more comfortable now um, to be able to get together virtually. Um, but again, I agree with the comments earlier. It's different when you're actually in the office physically. And so we ourselves at ASEN are encouraging more and more people uh, to come to the office, dipping their toe in the water once a week, nagiging twice a week, nagiging three times a week. Um, and again, uh, we're very flexible there, I think. And that's the key. If you remember my comment earlier, the flexibility I think is there and that's what's very much appreciated by our employees. So I'm you're going to ask a question. You're in good Sunny, you're on mute. Go ahead, Carol. Carol. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Gina, thanks so much for sharing the, uh, you know, your, your uh, business model, bringing it all together. So my question is, um, how are you differentiating yourselves from the competition? Like, there are other banks, you know, the other large banks. I'm just curious to know how are you differentiating yourselves? Because, as you know, all these tools are available to everyone now. I mean, that's the thing about technology. It, the costs are going down and everyone has access to it. So how would you differentiate? Or what is the, you know, the aspect that really differentiates you from the rest? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carol. From... Uh, is your question related to differentiating ourselves from competitors in the business yes. or in, yes. yes and internally as, as HR yeah. in HR okay well, well both as a business using the yes. HR strategies that you've right. talked about you know yes. because HR is driving that thank you that's right okay so um we believe that we are able to differentiate our uh, uh, our bank you know, compared to other uh, competitors with the focus on customer, okay? So customer obsession is now, I, how should say, a, a mantra of each and every BPI employee, okay? And we are, uh, we, we, and towards that, we are uh, creating uh, what we call signature uh, experiences for our customers, making sure that we address uh, their needs uh, and not just uh, going into selling products we, what, uh, we have, but really identifying what our clients uh, need no? and, uh, um, and providing them that customer delightful experience that we would like to differentiate ourselves compared to other banks. Internally, what I think uh, makes us different from other banks no, is the way we care about our employees. Our mantra internally is service with a heart. Service with a heart that provides employees the feeling of being cared for as an organization. And um, I believe uh, we, uh, our employees felt just that, no? in the way we uh, conducted ourselves during the pandemic, allowing them um, leaves, uh, paid leaves, uh, which other um, banks were not doing, giving them certain allowances, etc., and also making sure those who are, um, uh, those with comorbidities, uh, those who are more at risk, 
were given more flexibility to work from home. You know, if Thank I can you. jump in, uh, uh, there, there are really two things that I've essentially seen for organizations who've done that brilliantly well. I think Gina uh, really put the heart uh, uh, out. And I think the intent matters. And if you have the right intent, most often you will be consistent with that. Otherwise you will, you will do something, uh, but you will not be able to stay consistent with that. So consistency, I guess, in organizations is very critical. It is actually what delivers the real meaning over a period of time. Uh, there are no easy and low hanging fruits here, but doing that consistency and consistently will only come if you're fundamentally believing mm. in that and that really comes into the heart. The second element really for us is almost every organization is customer obsessed. And we spend a lot of our time and millions of dollars in understanding what our customer really wants. I would challenge to put a question forward to everyone in the audience. How many of us have any empirical research on what our employees want, what our employees prefer? Uh, and I think that is fundamentally where the answer will be that are we driven only by the market benchmarks so I'm going to do it but because the rest five organizations around me in my industry are doing it, or I want to do it because I know this will be something which is valued by my employees because I've cared to listen to my employees. In the latter, very few organizations will fall. In the former, almost everybody will fall. There is an entire consulting industry that flourishes just on market benchmarks which I believe is a recipe to kill any new idea or innovation because we will constantly just keep following each other. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandeep. Those are very important insights that you've shared. The clock says it's 10.58 and there's, we have time for one last question from the box and that's from Michael Hamor. Now that everyone is curious about the future of work, how do we influence educational institutions as to how they prepare students to also be future-ready professionals. And I would like to ask the panel's permission to answer this question myself, because uh, I know that most recently, the Philippines Commission on Higher Education ran a program with the Asian Institute of Management, in which I taught, uh, involving presidents and senior administrators of state colleges and universities. And the focus was on the smart university, the focus on how today's higher education institutions would be able to adapt to, uh, to the technology-driven uh, present and future. And I could assure you that many of our uh, state university and, and state college presidents and senior administrators are very well attuned to the wave of the future. So on that note, I'd like to request our uh, chair of the, of our, our committee chair, uh, Rico de Guzman, to give the closing remarks. Rico, any parting shots uh, for our panel and for our audience? Well, um, uh... I, I, I am uh, pleased to note that this is uh, a very engaging session. It was, uh, I think, uh, one of the uh, webinars where we've had uh, more than 200 participants. Uh, thank you indeed for uh, the uh, efforts of uh, the committee members, the speakers, the panelists, the moderator. Uh, this is not the last and this uh, it's just one of uh, a series of webinars that MAP is uh, embarking on for this year. So thank you for participating in this webinar.